atrás y puntero. Adelante. Adelante. Atrás y puntero. Okay. Hola. ¿Qué tal? Buen día. Good morning, everyone. The idea is to share with you the experience we had to implement IPv6 in Telecom's Argentina network. I'm Sergio Bustamante. I work in the field of network transformation at Telecom. The idea is to share with you the process we had, the decisions we made along the way, and how we made the transition towards IPv6 to date. So the motivation we had is what is normally explained in this room, namely the exhaustion of IPv4 addresses. And also, as we evolve every five years, the devices connected to the network are duplicated, so if we maintain ourselves over time, a company as big as Telecom with many millions of clients and services such as 5G and IoT come up, with the IP before addressing we have, we don't have enough capacity to cater for those services. The IP before network Again, we... increase. <laughs> They are not uh, obtained because LACNIC is not uh, giving IPv4 in the short term because there is n n uh, it is depleted and we got convinced that the solution was IPv6. We uh, conducted analysis in 2021 of how we were how our portfolio of IPv4 uh, uh, folders was available and in October we reached the conclusion that with business as usual by October this year we wouldn't have any IPv4 addresses available to offer our clients so there we started with the process of transformation at Telecom so when we decided to promote this we our objective was to deploy IP to implement a dual stack IPv6 in those networks and services that we identified that could support it and could be adopted. The main challenge was to reduce the impact of the depletion of IP uh, of both public and private, uh, and uh, we tried that that evolution that we are taking to IPv6 be for all the products and services in uh, the folder, especially the um, in our portfolio, especially fixed uh, internet, mobile internet, and video on demand. And there we put together a working group to uh, solve uh, the process that we had in this type of work. What we, we decided to uh, put together a community um, each uh, group they have uh, their the the themes and they are uh, and they are working trying to solve the problems of IPv6 in each of the topics. So we put a group on FTTH, another one to so solve the problems of the mobile network security, the access the access to HPC and another essential thing that is connectivity at home the number of devices connected in the network are varied some of them are apt uh, to work uh, for an IPv6 others are not available with dual stack so we have to contemplate all uh, those issues at home where the customer uh, receives uh, the um, the problems uh, so in this end to end the evolution both at a technical level and at a systems level and uh, the platforms and also in the process level um, when we started one of the topics that we focused on was reinforcing knowledge of the entire community on IPv6 
And there, one of the tools that we had at hand that was highly productive was to make the most of all the courses at the uh, LACNIC uh, courses. So our community for those, uh, our teams, uh, received great support. About 100 people, among including uh, te technical people and systems people, they worked with these, uh, they took these courses and we learned in a process where IPv6 started to be disseminated in the technical community. Each member of this community, as we uh, increased autonomy and in each of these topics solved the problems. One of the first steps that we gave after creating the community was to talk to the people that uh, sell uh, the services in our company to see which were the services that telecom was uh, leveraging for the future to be able to take it as a priority. So the, we um, said we decided some products, uh, the, the fixed access to TDPH and, and HFC and the mobile network. Then we, re we worked with some support documents that we have in the LACNIC community. I won't mention them all, but these are the documents of the text that we leave. We, if you want to evolve in IPv6, please use them because they were very useful to us, especially the 12-step uh, document uh, of what to do uh, that was developed by Jordi, and we adapted it in Telecom Argentina to a decalogue of um, that we all, it's, it's, uh, those are decisions that we always uh, considered as we moved forward. The other step was to analyze our transportation network. The transportation networks need to be fit for IPv6 in all the routers, because if we want to give a massive service, we can't uh, deploy IPv6 in some areas or in a region of the country that does not support it. So we analyze the transportation network. Our transportation network is a network that uh, are, has evolved uh, recently. We had the routers all available for dual stack. And so we started to implement the development per product. Another thing we did before we started with the evolution of the prod products was to put together an addressing plan. And there we received support of LACNIC. We talked a lot with Alejandra Costa, who gave us a lot of tips of how to put together the addressing plan. And we used different design premises before we developed what we are presenting today. First of all, to have a service-oriented network. On the other hand, to use the resources optimally so that the tables of uh, the addressing tables, uh, the routing tables should be as simple as possible. And then to implement, to facilitate the implementation of future services, the network, we want the network to be scalable and flexible and to have a, a small impact um, on the transformation. We have assigned a slash uh, 20 of IPv6 with the first two neighbors so we could identify the service. In these cases, as I told you earlier, the mobile networks, the massive networks, and we, for the future, we identified a space for corporate services. And on the other hand, identif easily identifying the networks of infrastructure. After that uh, identification of a uh, service, we uh, focused on the region and the geographical location of the well, services are providers that allows us to easily identify and to to have routing tables less uh, uh, more nimble so each router has its ip uh, for each uh, service this is our transportation network there you have 
quite a uh, graphic uh, scheme in the upper part we have uh, the way we exit the internet uh, we have uh, a transportation core is ipv4 and we receive support of 6p and cp to transport the dual stack between the different components of the border we have the border and the international exit uh, and the border uh, for the uh, clients and in the lower part of the collections of H FTT agents of the mobile network, uh, the, the uh, tier uh, three and tier four layers, and something that we we wanted all the uh, clients with peering and CDNs to support. Uh, IPv6 because the clients 70 or 80 percent of the traffic that uh, the clients that consume the internet usually are contained in a CDN or some peering so if we want the consumption of IPv6 to start to beat IPv4 we need both CDNs and uh, peerings and our international uh, uh, um, uh, outbound made to be IPv6 compatible and we succeeded most CDNs and peerings that we have are already using IPv6 so that is something essential if we want the traffic to flow in IPv6 and uh, not so much uh, in IPv4 so here I'm going to briefly pre present the scheme that we uh, have um, we started with the network of access uh, of HFC. There we have the addressing plan in the network. I won't give you the details because it's uh, too technical, but the I, I want you to uh, go home with the idea that now different contrary to what happens with IPv4 where we give them a, a private network the clients in their internet uh, device they're going to have an IPv6 addressing that will be accessible from anywhere in the world so you have to be very careful about security and especially the cave modems we are giving them a slash 56 you're going to see that in hfc and in ftth that we are now giving 56 so we no longer give an uh, an, uh, an address but a complete network to the home uh, connection so and with the issue of htpc we conducted a lab test once that lab test was satisfactory, we went to a field test identifying the friend clients, friendly clients, part of the telecom community. We migrated to dual stack. With them, we uh, identified some problems that we had in the implementation and we solved them in that field test the field test was done first for public dual stack and then for it, uh, private dual stack public and private and another important thing that we did at the lab was to standardize all the cable modem models of uh, and identifying all the features even if the vendors tell you that it's all dual stack, it's good to conduct a test and especially a security test. In some cable modems, as an experience, for instance, we found that it depends on their radium. For instance, at 5.8 megahertz, in some cases they didn't raise megahertz, while in another one it did. So it's important to test not just that the device is suitable, but that in all its frequencies it may raise the IPv6 with no problems. In FTTH, we are still at the level of lab test, not yet in production. We are waiting for the development of the systems associated to FTH, and our next step is to conduct a field uh, step with the modality of friend clients we are um, standardizing things with the vendors of uh, fi 5 and 6 uh, wi-fi 5 and 6 and 
the idea is to launch a field uh, test and we believe that by the third and fourth quarter this year all our clients will be in dual stack and finally the star product that is the mobile network when we started we thought that it would be much more complicated than the fixed line but really it was not that was not the case um, it was much more simple when we identified with our vendors what we had to do to support IPv6 through the lab tests and the field tests. We could, we became more confident and we started implementing dual stack. And here there's a very important thing that is accompanying the systems or the rating of the mobile we need to Oh, you consider that you no longer rate some consumption in uh, V4, but you have to identify those services with their IPv6 addressing. Usually you have packets where you promote or you don't uh, um, uh, uh, consider some destinations such as the social media. Well, through uh, here we identify those services and we have to adapt all the rating systems for that to happen. So it is very important to accompany this uh, work of all the systems, people that are working with rating. Another thing that we considered was international roaming. We are signing dual stack agreements that enables us to slowly migrate with roaming. And a very important thing in mobile is to leave EGC NAT. Uh, now all the mobile have CGNAT, they're all working with uh, private uh, networks. So as you deploy IPv6, you download the use of, D, uh, of CGNAT and you leave uh, idle infrastructure that saves. Uh, um, uh, and if you want to expand to 5G, the investment on CGNAT will be much smaller. Here you have some indicators for monitoring uh, the evolution. I'm sorry, you won't see it very clearly, but let me tell you, in Telecom Argentina, we have 20 million clients at present. We have 4 million clients in dual stack. This is a result that we are standardizing the terminals. The vendors supply the features to have dual stack in the mobile terminal. And as time goes by, we add more and more clients with available dual stack. With those 4 million uh, clients that we have in dual stack, the traffic of IPv6 of the mobile is also already 12% on IPv4. So 12% of all the traffic is also already occurring in IPv6. And there is a graph too that tells us how this deployment uh, uh, happens. Region, we did it region by region as we identify some regions with smaller flows of uh, clients. And we became, we started with a smaller, and then as we became more confident, we started to expand it. Today we have 100% of the network available for dual stack. And as the mobile phone terminals uh, are available for dual stack, they will gradually add it to this network. And what will continue to happen is that the traffic in IPv6 will continue to grow over the traffic of IPv4. There is also another issue that is very important to be highlighted, and that is security. In IPv4, there's a security model that is not 100% compatible with IPv6. I, when you look at the product uh, of development of IPv6, you need to consider that the, all, everybody working in security must understand how it works uh, with IPv6, the, that the people may get uh, trained to learn how an IPv6 network is where the client no longer has an IP in each device, but each device uh, has a public uh, um, IP and uh, to contemplate all the security processes that you have to contemplate in IPv6. We focus a lot on border security with Arbor. We have Arbor already working with IPv6 to uh, mitigate attacks and the
Muy importante eso para... The fireworks in uh, the client's devices are important so that both the client and the telecommunications infrastructure will not uh, be amenable to IPv6 threat attacks. So a client no longer has an IP, but an entire network uh, supporting it. And it's important for the security people to accompany that to, so that they will implement uh, me security mechanisms different from those of IPv4. It is also important to apply vulnerability tests uh, to check uh, the um, uh, machines in, uh, at our clients. So we have to test that there are no bugs or anything like that that may lead to vulnerabilities. These are our indicators. This is the current situation in telecom. 7% of our network is on IPv6 traffic. Hopefully, by the end of the year, the traffic will be 30%. The evolution is um, barely beginning. It's, it will continue in future years. IPv6, the next step will be on the corporate market, all that are B2B team uh, markets. In transportation, we are already implementing the first steps on ISIS for uh, uh, and our uh, uh, target is to sometime reach IPv6 only. We understand that there are some, some steps to be given, uh, but taken, but that is our objective uh, uh, in uh, the short term. So there in that chart, you see that the IPv6 curve goes down, drops in traffic, and because we detected a vulnerability in one of our cable modems, so we had to remove it from dual stack service and we had to put it in IPv4 until we could solve that vulnerability. And then we deployed it again as dual stack. So it's important to I remark this as security issue again. You always have to be to bear that in mind. So this is all. I don't know whether you have any questions. If you want to learn uh, to ask about something specifically. Thank you. Sergio, could you stay for one second there? Because we have a question from a remote participant, and uh, they're going to read it. We have a question by Azael Fernandez, who says, good morning. When do you estimate to have to get reach 30% IPv6 traffic? And for IPv6 only, what is your estimate? Well, the objectives for later 2023 is 80% of the traffic in IP IPv6 and IPv6 only, we estimate that in a couple of years. First, we need to evolve our transport and uh, that our devices may have XLAT to go to a transition mechanism that will enable us to reach IPv6 only. That demands a lot of uh, uh, adaptations of systems and to, ID and to identify where we put CLAT functionality in the network. We estimate that in two years we'll reach that stage. Thank you, Sergio. Well, we have another question. Jordi Palette. I have a doubt. Why do you set that limit of 30%? Because based on my experience, as soon as you enable dual stack for IPv6 only, there's no difference in that regard. If your cache is, I understand that you have caches, Netflix, Meta, etc., have IPv6 support. I understand that that is the case. Basically, the traffic, the home traffic will reach not 30%, but 80% of users with IPv6, of course. Yes, thank you for your question. There's an issue that is important for IPv6 to happen. Something that we need is that the, the devices that the clients use at home may be suitable for IPv6. TV sets, the objectives with which they reach uh, OTTs, mobile phones, all have to be 
um, fit for IPv6. In Argentina, we are not going through the, our best economic moment, so that renewal of terminals of the devices that users have at home is not occurring at the speed that we thought. That is why we are rather conservative in our ambitions as to the traffic that we can reach. I feel there are no more questions. We have no remote questions are in the room. So Sergio, thank you, not just for your uh, presentation, but because you were also uh, ready to uh, speak first. We invite Pablo